I'm Mark Shadoff, and the chairman of the board of the LA Fashion District, uh, Business Improvement District. Uh, I'd like to, we have a special guest today, and uh, I wanted to start off and introduce our special guest. We have Sentiment Miguel Santiago, who'd like to come up and uh, give a few words. So please, give him a hand, and uh, I'll talk to you Thank you. Thanks for letting me drop by at the last minute, so uh, I'm very grateful for that. I want to thank you for your hard work and helping to make the downtown Los Angeles a lot better, particularly for your advocacy uh, around the issue of homelessness. And I'm grateful because I've been told now that through your bid, you'll be helping us to round up the much necessary support. Some of you guys may have seen it in the mail, and gals. Uh, we're trying to change the definition of what conservatorship means. And this is really important. You guys know it, right? When somebody has a medical necessity, you want to help that person. And this is now more evident with the homeless population, because currently we can't help somebody uh, because the threshold for conservatorship is pretty, pretty high. They either can't feed themselves, clothe themselves, or home themselves, or house themselves. So we're trying to change it to be medical necessity so that an agency, yourself, the county, or any nonprofit can help get somebody the service that they need when we know they're on your doorstep and we want to give them those services and get them off the street and out of the path towards recovery. So we're very grateful that you'll help uh, in taking the lead role in trying to help us to change the law on the state. Uh, we're also very uh, grateful with the communication that we've had. And it's really important, I'll tell you, because last year when we received a phone call from your bid about a bill running through the legislature to make, uh, to make public records requests available for bids, we knew that we had to stand up and we had to fight with you folks. And those are the kind of things that are incredibly important. Next week we'll be rolling out a significant package on homelessness funding. Some of you guys have seen that we've been working on the legislature, so we look forward to your support uh, getting the rest of our colleagues in Los Angeles and up and down the state uh, to prioritize this particular issue. Because we know that it's it's the existential crisis that we are facing in our lifetime, the issue of homelessness. And I see Council Member Jose Rizar uh, in the back, a staunch champion on, on eradicating homelessness. We can give him a round of applause. From We look forward to partnering with you folks and continuing to work on some of the good work that we've been doing. I uh, appreciate being here today and hope to continue a long-term relationship. Thank you and uh, we'll keep chipping away. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just also want to mention that we have food in the back. So feel free to uh, endeavor uh, on the snacks you have in the back of the room. Okay. Uh, 2018 annual uh, meeting for the LA Fashion District, and uh, I've been a member of this board since the bid was founded as a small pilot project back in 1996. So that's about 22 years. And back then, our vision of the district was one of the where businesses could thrive and the community could uh, could grow into a neighborhood. And in the last few years, DTLA and the Fashion District has a rapid has, has seen a rapid uh, and dramatic increase in development that seems not to uh, be slowing down anytime soon. This year our meeting will focus on the policies and projects showing what downtown is uh, looking to become. Um, this meeting will focus on, anyway. Uh, so today, who we, we will come out here today is to exhibit the upcoming Fashion District Development. If you had not had the opportunity, please feel the exhibits in the back of the room after the meeting. Um, we have another guest here. Uh, which I'd like to introduce, which is uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Councilman uh, Jose Lizar. And if you could please come up and, um, and speak to our uh, 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 rely upon 
for additional security and support and it's always great to see uh, the bid personnel out there so thank you so much to the board to the team uh, and to the staff and uh, let's give the staff a big round of applause thank you so much for being here. And uh, I thought I'd go over just a little bit about uh, what's happening in the city from my perspective in terms of downtown. And, and as you all know, and just looking at the projects that are being presented here today, it's a pretty exciting time for downtown LA. We are finally transforming downtown into that downtown we've always wanted, where we have more economic activity, where there's more people living, where there's more people visiting. And if you look at all those indicators uh, of, uh, of livability, of uh, people of residential development, uh, commercial activity, they're all growing in the right direction. Uh, and one interesting thing about the fashion district is that this is, in my view, the next area of growth for downtown LA. As you see South Park and all that happened up here, and you see what's happening in the Arts District, uh, you see new projects coming up, new proposed that, that are gonna revitalize and have more activity in this area that connect South Park all the way down to the Arts District and connect with the historic core. So it's a pretty interesting place for downtown LA and we want to continue moving in that direction to, su to support these types of projects. Why? Because it brings additional jobs, it makes a higher and better use of our existing parcel of property and it also provides for more uh, residential living, something that as you all know, uh, we need more of here in the city of LA. Our community plan that we're doing, uh, the update, in fact, this area here is slated to be upzoned so that some of these projects that you see being proposed don't have to get the general plan amendment, don't have to get any zone changes, it'll be by right in the future. So we are anticipating in our community plan for this area to be upzoned uh, so that, don't ask me which partial, I don't have the plan that's for me, but generally that's the idea. And what's exciting about this area is that the new development we're seeing is being done by people, primarily by people who've been here for a while, uh, for a while, and owners and people who know the area, and that's a really good sign too. And, and in, if you look at the flower market proposal, for example, long-time owners who do not want do not want to kick out the existing business and the flower business, but want to redo that parcel of land, keep the flower business at the bottom and residential on top. So there's a lot of creativity that will not remove existing businesses and existing interest here, but add to it and go up, which is something we want to do in downtown LA. So uh, I'm really excited uh, to see what uh, the growth that we're seeing. My job as your council member is to represent your needs and I, the sense I get is to support what's happening in the community plan but also to continue uh, to support some of the uh, safety and cleanliness of the area. The good news is that through our advocacy in the budget we just adopted this past Monday in City Council, we have more money uh, for cleanup in campus. And that is very good news because the fashion district, in fact, is one of the hardest hit areas in the city where we do not clean up encampments or large multi item trash areas. And we have or had about a backup of requests, the backlog of requests, we had about 5,200 requests on our backlog list of encampment cleanups. And we were adding 200 a month to that list. So I did the calculations and we would not get there to uh, clean all that up for another 20 years or so. We advocated and thanks to the mayor and the city council, we were able to get 17 million more dollars for encampment cleanups. And we changed it so that we do no longer equalize it for 15 council districts, but we go to the highest need areas first. So that's very good news. That means the next uh, year, um, we're going to gear up within the next three months or so. We're going to have a lot more academy cleanups. But along with that, you know, we cannot clean up the cabinets unless we provide more shelter for homeless, to, uh, homeless individuals, people who are experiencing homelessness. And as you all know, uh, we are in a uh, historic time in the city of LA where we are now doing a whole lot more for homeless, and rightly so, because homelessness continues to increase. Uh, as you all know, we, homelessness increased 20% from last year to this year, and it's not unique to Los Angeles. That is happening across the country. What is unique to Los Angeles is that we have the highest concentration of homeless here in downtown in Skid Row. 
So um, as we've done more to address that, we now have a comprehensive strategic plan uh, to address homelessness, something we've never had before. We're implementing that plan now. We first wanted to put in a long-term uh, plan, which was to provide more permanent supportive housing. So we passed Measure HHH to provide $1.2 billion uh, to provide 10,000 units of permanent supportive housing over the next 10 years. And now we are in the phase of doing some more immediate things, which means immediate emergency shelter. We have in the budget $30 million to provide more emergency shelters throughout the city. I advocated for $20 million alone for Skid Row because the 10,000, 2,000 people who sleep on the streets every night, uh, we calculated based on what we did at a club level, we put up an emergency shelter there in the parking lot, which cost us about $20 million to house 2,000. Now that will help because uh, we not only want to uh, address the human suffering that is happening, but we could also only clean up the encampments if we have a place for them to go. So the idea would be, we're looking for public uh, property right now, for spaces where we can put up some emergency housing, shelter, uh, get individuals in there, no longer than six months, give them the services they need, and eventually put them on path to recovery to permanent support housing. And that's the idea. So as I, we're moving forward to implement a plan like that, I would ask that you think housing first, emergency housing for the individuals need, and then we can do the academy cleanups and have implement more than $17 million here to help with that. That's kind of a two-step process for you to take. We can do simultaneously, but that's the idea as we move forward with that. So last but not least, um, I wanted to also mention that uh, one of the things that has gone um, under the radar, and I just want to put it out there because we're going to vote on this soon, is uh, in 2015, the uh, staff, city staff came to me and said they wanted to demolish a Parker Center. And uh, that's the old LAPD headquarters just across the street from City Hall. And I asked, well, what are we going to do? Just build another building and not think long term? what's the bigger picture. We didn't have one, so I asked staff to develop a, a master plan for the Civic Center. And what's unique about this is that, as you know, most Civic Centers at nighttime, there's no activity. You go to work there, and you home, and it's a dead zone. As we're building a more dense, and, and with more density, more height to downtown lake, we will do the same thing for the Civic Center. We're gonna create a 24-hour Civic Center where we create more residential, more commercial, more retail around the area. And we're going to open it up with more green space and uh, more plazas, et cetera. We're going to release uh, soon uh, those designs. We have some designs ready that we adopted, but we're going to move forward with the initial phase one of that, which is to rebuild Parker Center, rebuild a new building there. So this would, the Civic Center Master Plan will do three things. One is to consolidate all the buildings of the employees that we have throughout the region, save money, build it on Civic Center. Two, create a 24 our civic center where we build more retail, more residential, more height around there. And three, create more plazas and green space around the civic center. That's going to be more inviting and welcoming. So look out for that. I know it's not necessarily a fashion district, it's downtown related, but it's something that to look forward to as we connect to the rest of downtown. So, um, uh, and last, uh, one of the things that I've been pushing forward to as well downtown is to create more pedestrian friendly streets. And uh, I want to thank because the efforts of Rina and the whole staff here and everyone else and the board, uh, the Los Angeles uh, improvements were made from Olympic to 7th. Uh, we just had the ribbon the other day, and uh, thank you so much for that. That fits in line with trying to do that throughout downtown, where we make it a bit more livable, by make it a bit more walkable. So thank you so much for your work on that. We also have several other initiatives like that made in Spring Street, where we're doing similar things from Olympic all the way down to First Street, but we are actually putting in bike lanes and would be unique because it's going to be one of the first in the cities where you actually have protected bike lanes but use cars, parked cars, as the border to protect the bike lanes and reconfigure extended sidewalks. Uh, we're also, uh, we did, as you know, Broadway, one of the largest road backs in the city where we took one lane of traffic each way to calm traffic down, make it more pedestrian friendly. And now you see that before when you would walk, they thought you're on the freeway, right? And buses whizzing by. But it's a bit more calm, it's a bit more business friendly, and uh, that's the idea for downtown. But we also want to make sure we don't create more traffic jams in that as well. So, as we do that, we try to balance both approaches. Anyway, I could talk forever, uh, but I'll leave it at that. And uh, you give a politician a microphone and they speak uh, for hours. They just write them in. So, unless anybody has any urgent questions, if you, anyone have questions, is that okay?
Questions or comments? Complaints? Yes, sir. It's, it's, I knew you would have a question. Or a <laughs> it's not urgent, but it's very important. So, council member, I'd like you to look into mid-block uh, crosswalks because the timing on them is so long. It would, it would take less time to walk to the corner, go across, and come back in a U than to wait for that crosswalk. They have to. They have to if we want to be pedestrian friendly, let's do it, and let's shorten the time they have to wait. It could be up to three to five minutes yeah. for these uh, for these lights to turn, and it affects all of you here in the fashion district and those of us over in the uh, financial district and everywhere. So. Let's have the mid-block uh, crosswalks do what they're intended to do in a timely manner. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And did you know that this gentleman uh, was uh, one of the reasons we see a lot of revitalization in downtown these days is uh, for something called the Adaptive Use Ordinance for Residential, which allowed a lot of these historic buildings to be repurposed, uh, cheaper for property owners to repurpose them, and easier. So. Uh, this gentleman here was involved in that way back, and so thank you so much for your work on that. I, I get the revitalization of downtown life for two reasons, and many would agree, and, uh, which is adaptive reuse ordinance for residential, and second, Staples LAI, which brought people to rediscover downtown and all the activity there. And the future of downtown is that. I think it's more residential, new industries moving in, like water music down at the, uh, the old uh, board. Companies, Spotify, moving into the arts district. So, you tech slash innovative companies are moving in, but also uh, the features of entertainment, restaurants, bars, people visiting with all the entertainment venues as well. Sorry. And schools. And schools. We need schools. Yeah. And schools. And it, it, talk about the biggest challenge, uh, challenges for downtown, as I see them. What is how do we attract families and keep families? And uh, that's really big. Challenges because uh, that brings stability. Uh, more people call my office and say, Hey, why don't we get more safety, etc. etc. Uh, but also affordable housing um, because, well, mid level housing, I think. We have two extremes that we've built over the last few years. We have the lowest type of housing in downtown LA, the lowest of any other place, and we built a lot of luxury over the last few years because we just wanted any type of investment. We said, Come in, come in. We just wanted the investment. Now, with developers are doing general plan amendments and curriculum changes, we have more flexibility to negotiate with them and ask for more affordable housing that you need. Uh, to have that mid-level uh, affordable housing meaning for work for housing, you know, mid-level housing. So that's our challenge, I think. All right. Yes. Hi. You had mentioned I know the small sections of particularly along the <laughs> Angeles, there are a number of the older Mentor stores that are closing yeah. down. Um, I spoke with a few of the owners of those businesses, some of them that are still there, who are excited about the redevelopment, they are closing on like Jewish Drive, so I'm really curious. Others who are closing <laughs> businesses because they were already affected by the right of the No, I haven't, uh, not in particular to this area, but what we have done in other areas, for example, is that we've had a comprehensive approach to it. We got together with local businesses, like, for example, on Broadway, and talked about the challenges of being there, the, the rising cost of rent, which is not unique, it wasn't unique to that area. So we talked about, um, and we got together with the property owners and other solutions to that. And it was more about exchange of information. I know on Broadway, it's like, what are your, what are your expectations? What are your, our expectations? How do you see this moving forward? Um, and sometimes the tenants simply didn't talk to the program. So right. just getting together in a meeting like that and made this discussion happen, which is it's a private affair, but there's something that we can do at the city park to help uh, foster that communication, that discussion. Uh, we would be more than happy to do it. One thing we are doing in Boa Heights, for example, and I'm, is that we're looking to see how we provide incentives for. Uh, property owners to give long-term leases to businesses, tenant businesses who have been there for a long time so that they don't get displaced in this time when there are rights rents throughout the city. Um, and what type of incentives are those? Perhaps we do facade improvements for them, perhaps we uh, you know, work on energy efficiency for them and have either the key out there and you know, do efficiency, provide free efficiency 
plan and implement those for them. So there's different incentives to try to provide you know, the property owners with property owners so that they get long term leases to guarantee them for a long time. We're doing that, we're looking to do that on Cesar Chavez and Bo Hines. I haven't talked to anybody here in downtown, but we're looking to do something like that. But we're all going to do something like that. Yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. In regards to the local uh, issue and so forth, and the disaster issue, as you, I'm sure, are aware of the increased amount of fire we've seen, and we've lost a pretty large structure because of it. I, I understand, I hear exactly what the we're anticipating to take care of these issues in somewhat the long run, I hope the short run. But until that happens, do you know of anything that has taken place in terms of policing or surveillance, any increased amount of funds? Because we have an issue right now that by the time these people get taken someplace where they can be taken care of, some of these buildings aren't going to be here. Yeah. So is there anything that's going to be done between now and the time all this happens? It's going to increase the surveillance on a very, very dangerous situation where buildings are coming down in the fire. Yeah, I've spoken with Chief Terrazas about that particular issue. My staff has taken a tour um, with, uh, with the local fire uh, units uh, on that. We've also spoken to LAPD, and LAPD tells me they're going to be more vigilant about the uh, fires, uh, people who put them up, put them out. You know, in the past it was, when, when, before we got this recent uh, number of uh, high profile uh, homeless fires that we've seen, um, yeah, our personnel would see it, and like, unless it was a big, large enough fire that they'd come by and ask them to turn it off, et cetera. But now they're being vigilant to any spark, any little fire, any, any little sign of somebody having equipment to start a fire, a barbecue set, anything else. They're going to go out immediately and confiscate that and harass them to remove it. So we're being more vigilant about it, um, and uh, we're hoping that um, you know, even coming with summer months, we won't see as many coming up. But our fire department and our police are being more vigilant. Literally, we have two different cities. We have a daytime operating business, we have yeah. a nighttime transit into the situation. The worst. Yeah. Can I ask you if there are any laws on the books now with regards to the fire department? Is the fire department not concerned that there are streets that are blocked and locations that we can't get to because of the homeless people, these poor homeless people that need to be helped? Yeah. But is the fire department not concerned with laws that they have on the books that we're blocking the street and with the people and buggies and baskets and Maybe their trucks can't go through an emergency. How do they deal with it as a fire department? The, the law is that if a public right of way is blocked, we have the right to remove it immediately. Uh, also, who's we? Who's we? Uh, police department, uh, not fire department, police department. Right. Um, they don't give that right to the bids, unfortunately. Uh, but it is, uh, it is the LAPD can't remove it if it is blocked in the right of way. Second, and this is a big problem we have right now, I think, is that right now on the law, the law is on the books that tents are supposed to be taken down during the day. Um, but however, given the resources, if you ask LAPD to go out there and enforce that right now, that's all they will be doing, right? If you don't have the resources to tell everybody to come out and take the tents. So without saying it's an official policy, I think what is happening right now in the city is like, Let's do the emergency housing, then we would have more resources, more personnel out there to ask you, hey, you have a place to go, you can ask you to take down your tents during the day. I'm not saying that's the official policy, but that's kind of what I see happening in practice. So hopefully we find some sites in the near future, put up some emergency housing, and then have the ability to ask more people to take down their tents during the day. If they're blocking, for example, on 7th Street, um, you know, it was pretty bad for a while, but it got cleaned up for a while, and now it's back where I see people walking in the street because they can't even walk on the sidewalk. Uh, something like that, with myself and my staff, where you see it, you gotta bring to the attention right away of LAPD to ask them to remove those tents right away. They're blocking the, pub, blocking the public right away and creating a health hazard for individuals simply trying to walk down the street. And if they're blocking, 
and the existing businesses, I know um, that could be removed immediately as well. That, that is in the book, if you're, you can't be blocking entrances to a business. I'm sorry to take up your question, but this is my last one. Sure. Uh, in regards to the trash, and uh, like particularly under the freeway, the Santa Monica freeway and so forth, yeah. is that a whole different department, a whole different trash issue with the city? Because I see a lot more trash in our fashion district in regards to our street than I see anywhere else in the city of Los Angeles. Is that a financial issue? Issue that is totally through the trans, uh, uh, sanitation department. The yeah. city, they can't. They don't have enough funds to address this. And that's part of the additional seventeen million dollars that we have oh, now. Okay. We're essentially doubling our crew to clean up the trash. Right. Um, and that's something that I advocated for because that's what I saw. If you notice around downtown areas like the industrial area, places that don't have bids, um, there you can see a whole lot more trash. The industrial area underneath the bridge. Some of the areas that's where the trash really accumulates. And so I've asked for the additional funds. So like I said, we're doubling our crews to clean up the cabinets and trash. Uh, and they're gonna start up here like in the next three months. Uh, so we're gonna see a lot more cleanups more recent. And um, uh, we're hoping to to this be this is ground zero for what you're talking about. Because I made that argument. I looked at data from last year, and like there were three council districts that had the most requests on the backlog. Back back My district, D9, which is South LA, and CB13, which is Hollywood, Northeast LA. And so we asked well, why this was so. And they said they were going, they're, they're giving the resources equally to council districts, but we have the most problems. So now they're not only going to have double the crews, they're going to do it by need. Go out to the greatest need first, which is here downtown. We're going to have a lot more attention in the near future. So, and let's keep an eye on that because one thing is to allocate the money, give the resources, and now if it's not being done now, then we have to go back and fix it with the departments and, and ask why not. So, thank you very much. Um, I have a question regarding the recent discussions about legalizing street vending. Yeah. Sidewalk so punching. Um, so as you may know, in the fashion district, uh, many of the property owners have worked in tandem with the bid, the fashion district bid, and LAPD to control sidewalk vending. Yeah. So just, it, it, my example is in the Santa Maple Alley area, where we have many sidewalk um, street vendors. And uh, recently, it was disappointing when the council um, stepped away from allowing the property owners to have a say or opt out of let's say being in a sidewalk vending zone. Because in an area where we have so many, first of all, um, we have currently so many sidewalk vendors, um, it's actually contributes to sort of the culture of the area, um, commerce and everything. And uh, uh, I was hoping that the council would kind of work with the property owners, kind of take that feedback and find that there was something valuable in that. And I really need the council's help on that to legalize and recognize there's a need for sidewalk vending, but just allow the local communities to control it. Is that something that you would be you know, open to and favor of? Yes, and I think that the, the, the final ordinance is not finished. The conceptual framework, as we called it, was approved. And um, it was two per block at the most. Uh, and I wasn't sure where we left it with the zones. And that, that really wasn't finalized. That, that was going to be finalized or not. The discussion didn't happen around that. Right. But I, that's still there. Right. The discussion. That we could somehow work with the council to allow the certain areas that already have it to kind of continue on as it's working since we work with LAPD and we work with the fashion district to sort of continue what we have because, of course, it might be difficult um, yeah. enforcing that too. And right. a lot yeah. of you could please work with Katie and, 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 and uh, my staff and, and um, okay. let the bids concerns be known to her as, as we finalize that. And I'm getting pulled here with the, uh, what we call it, right? Yeah, thank you. So we'll do that. But my biggest concern on our street vending ordinance, as is, is enforcement. Uh, I don't think we're going to have the resources to really enforce some of the issues uh, that, that, that we presented. So, um, we're going to have to think of more creative ways on how we have the other regulations that we enforce. Sorry. No, I Thank you very much. Thank you.
Again, we have food in the back, so please feel free to uh, eat the food. <laughs> uh, we have some more uh, guests here that I'd like to, uh, that they want to give uh, a presentation, and we also have uh, one of our three presenters. We have uh, Ryan Eck from the city, uh, the city of Los Angeles Planning Department, and uh, he's going to uh, talk with that and speak to us. We've developed uh, a set of core principles that are guiding what the plan for the year 2040 uh, in downtown should be. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, uh, it's our belief that a strong core um, of our city is... Oh, it's okay. ...is important to the health of the city overall. Um, and so we have a set of principles um, yeah, aligned with that. So the first is that we believe that um, we need to accommodate um, our expected growth into the future, but doing so in a way that is sustainable, that is healthy, that is inclusive, uh, that is supportive of, of, of the ongoing revitalization of downtown. Um, we want to do so in a manner that strengthens what's great about downtown Los Angeles, those individual buildings, those neighborhoods that make this a special place, um, and doing so in a way that we can grow and support our residential base, things like schools, um, retail, dry cleaners, um, public spaces, parks that are all necessary for a, a thriving uh, residential population. Also, downtown is the largest uh, job center in, in, in Southern California, and we want to make sure that downtown retains its role, um, its prominent place um, as the, the fundamental job center of the region. Um, we want to make sure, that, again, that we do so. Um, we grow in a way that uh, supports transit, supports pedestrians, supports bicyclists, and that we create a world-class set of streets and a public realm. Uh, what we've heard specific uh, to the fashion district, um, and a lot of this is echoed I saw in the trend report too, is the need to create a more complete community in the fashion district, um, meaning adding housing, uh, restaurant, hotel, things that extend the hours of life beyond just eight to five uh, here in the neighborhood. Um, and also focuses on, on the connections between uh, the neighborhoods that surround the fashion district, um, those corridors that run north-south, be it San Pedro, Los Angeles Street, or focus on 7th Street, 9th Street, and 11th Street. Um, also, uh, we've heard in our discussions the need uh, for flexible spaces, flexible buildings that can accommodate a, a range of industries, um, that fashion might take on a different character in the future, it might not all be 
retailing and uh, garment manufacturing here. It could be things where the intersection of technology and fashion come together, where there's uh, fashion financing, marketing, and the spaces need to accommodate a future of fashion here. Uh, and then, at the same time, we can strengthen the role of this neighborhood as a center for international business. Uh, so what can we expect um, from the DTLA 2040 plan? Um, first, there's expansive growth that is projected into the year 2040. Um, our projections from our regional demographer, which is the Southern California Association of Governments, does project that we will add an additional 125,000 residents within the downtown area um, by the year 2040 which represents the need for an additional 70,000 housing units, um, and we'll see additional 55,000 jobs, should that pan out. And specifically for the neighborhood, um, taking, taking the numbers I saw in the trend report, it looks like we have you know, uh, 2,100 housing units here today, um, projected to be 5,000 by 2020, but when we look at the 2040 plan, um, what the, the demographers have us projected at for the fashion district is about 8,700 units, but what the plan is actually calling for um, given the unique position of the fashion district, um, close to transit in the heart of downtown, the largest neighborhood here in downtown, um, uh, a projection of 14,000 potential housing units in, in the neighborhood by 2040. Um, so how do we get there? We have some big ideas as it relates to that. So the first is, is embracing growth. Um, if we're gonna get to those numbers, we have to be big and double down on growth. Um, getting out of the way, where it makes sense, and just focusing on those things that really do matter. Um, but doing so in a way that doesn't compromise what's unique and special about individual buildings or individual districts. Um, so being really tactical with our preservation. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep downtown uh, the job center of the Southern California region, and re but recognize at the same time that abundance of uh, housing that is available to uh, all income levels is, ju is good jobs policy. We want to focus less on form and performance, or form and, and use, I'm oh, sorry. We want to shift our focus to form and performance, less on use and process. Um, this is a neighborhood that's largely governed by its M2 zoning, um, and it, we want to make a more accommodating set of zoning rules in the future. And then this is, I think, the most important one here, is that we want to design comfortable spaces to move through and stay in. Um, I think the real success of the, the, the plan in 2040 is, is the quality of our streets and our public spaces. Um, it's not what downtown looks like when we see it from afar, but it's what it's like when you experience it from the ground level. Are you comfortable on the street walking around? Is it safe to bicycle? Are there parks that we can comfortably um, uh, re recreate? In? And I think that's really where we'll, we'll find our measure of success. Okay, so. Uh, the availability of housing will expand under the proposed plan. Here's the current situation today of where housing is allowed. And for reference, uh, on the left, that is the 110 freeway. The south is the 10 freeway down to the city of Vernon, uh, LA River uh, towards the east, and then that's Chinatown um, toward the north. Of the and so going forward, uh, greatly expanded availability of where housing would be allowed. Um, and of course, we have to increase our debt development potential as well. So the council member said, you know, he didn't have the specifics about where we're upzoning, but here is a sense of where we will be upzoning. So the bulk of the fashion district um, going up to an EFAR in some places, up to a 10 and a 13 even. Um, so here's a little bit of a, a more drilled down uh, view of it. I think that's Los Angeles Street that represents uh, the edge of the sort of uh, olive color. Um, and then San Pedro is uh, uh, right in the middle. So looking at uh, an eight max to our area ratio, um, the ability to do housing, hybrid industrial uses, retail, um, the lighter green where the city market project is, more community commercial serving uses, uh, with a full range of housing types there. And on the eastern edge, uh, a little bit lower FAR with an emphasis on sort of uh, the, the fashion district typical things we see like fabrication, wholesaling, and retail uses with the availability to do live work housing. Um, so along with um, our zoning today, we have a set of incentives that do sort of create value, capture value um, in terms of public benefits. And those typically are, are TFAR ordinance, adaptive reuse, um, a transit-oriented community strategy which was adopted as part of Measure JJJ and our Greater Downtown Housing Incentive Ordinance. This is what exists today. But going forward, um, we're looking at a, a wider palette of incentives that can 
do that value creation, value capture, but um, also value reinvestment um, to individual neighborhoods and properties um, so that we make sure that we can grow um, sustainable neighborhoods. Um, so one of, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but we have adaptive reuse 2.0, which would expand the scope and the range of where adaptive reuse is allowed. Um, uh, ability to create parks and open space in exchange for additional development rights, further incentives for affordable housing, uh, and a whole host of other incentives. I'm happy to go back to this and answer any question. Um, a big idea that we have is that we're not gonna allow parking to drive design. Um, we're gonna get out of the business of requiring parking. So the plan will call for no required parking, um, but we're gonna focus on what happens when you do provide parking. So, if you are providing it, um, we'll create additional incentives to share it with your neighbors so we can have better utilization of parking as a resource so it can be priced efficiently. Um, try to provide it underground to minimize the impacts to our streets. Um, wrap it with habitable uses to uh, make sure that there's a good connection between someone on the sidewalk and uses going on in the building. Um, and then also we ask that it be made adaptable for future use. If we envision a future where we have less need of of automobile parking, we want to make sure that we have buildings that are adaptable and we're not stuck with the uh, sandwich, you know, the middle of the sandwich where we have these parking levels that are really not usable for anything other than car storage. Um, we'd also like to remove any sort of density limitation um, and restructure any requirements that penalize density. Um, so throughout the plan area, you can see we don't require density in this portion of the plan area today. Going forward, this represents the entirety of where housing would be allowed. We would remove density as limitation. Uh, also allowing for a greater mix of uses so that we can create complete communities that are 24 seven. Um, and exactly what you were talking about earlier, how we wanna streamline our processes for projects that meet our expectations. Um, you don't need to go through years of review if you're doing things uh, just basic set of rules and requirements. Um, we want to take out the process from this and um, have more performative measures that help you get through the process quicker. Um, so to that end, we are you know, consolidating all the rules and regulations for downtown to be in one single document. Um, our downtown design guide will include all the rules for the fashion district, which is the arts district, and Chinatown as well. Um, so we're not looking across 12 different documents to understand what I can and can't build, what uses I can have. It'll all be very clear to understand in one single place. And so a little bit of the timeline going forward. We do have a plan map, a concept map out today, but uh, early fall we'll be releasing um, our first draft of our environmental impact report, the plan and the zoning itself, and then going through our public engagement process and the adoption process. Um, uh, from there, looking like we're, we'll be in the early parts of 2019 through adoption. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you all have. You know, once we get to the City Planning Commission, it's a little bit out of our control. It's really on um, the council to schedule it and move it forward. So that's sort of a best guess in terms of how long the process typically takes. Yeah. Yes, the, the aspect of no required parking and not limiting density, that to me seems to be a real end game problem because you're going to have such a concentration in the downtown area Without being able, without the ability to that area to be impacted or impact areas outside the downtown Los Angeles, and I, for the life of me, do not understand why you guys are taking that position. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you've seen a lot of cities take this route. Um, it it focuses uh, how much parking should be de de delivered on an individual developer, an individual project, because they understand best for their situation rather than the pseudoscience of the city saying, oh, it roughly is this many parking spots that should be delivered. Um, it also, you know, I think we've seen market studies that suggest that's one of the more expensive parts of doing development, and if our objective is to lower the cost of housing, of rent here, um, disassociating the cost of parking, to the extent that we can, it is a huge objective of this. We understand the concerns that, you know. Unless you have, unless you have a sophisticated internal 
delivery system and for that traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't understand what's going on down this yeah. downtown because we're seeing it going on right now. We're seeing large developments with no parking requirements, for, especially for the, for the, for the uh, homeless, mm -hmm. which is needed. But simply mm -hmm. establishing, I mean, this is my opinion, yeah. you're going to do what you want to do. Unless it's, it's open for public, for public It will be, certainly. But I just see you're going to, you're heading at the wall here with the amount of development and density that you want to put in down that area. And I think it's conceptually a great idea, but practically a message. Yes. It impacts the, the cost of a project, certainly. My developers in the room, like, what's the cost of an underground parking space right now? Sixty thousand. It's somewhere between sixty and one hundred thousand per space. So if we take out sixty thousand, sixty hundred thousand dollars per space per project, I mean that that will filter through into the cost of a project. Okay. Um, so I would think that public Absolutely. Yeah. So as an example, um, in the fashion district, there used to be a dash line that was to move down in April. That affects just this very negatively, and the housing structure also is affected by the housing market. Um, and I know that you talked about having a line crossing from the river to the west side of downtown. Um, my hope is that it would affect the areas that currently do not have public transportation other than bus and half the dash line, half the subway. Um, and, you know, I feel like your, the focus tends to be in the north part of the district, not in the south part, the south part, which is uh, desperately underserved. And, you know, Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And it's, you know, this doesn't happen in isolation. It has to come with increased mobility options, too. And I, we see that coming, and a system that will help incentivize, you know, increased transit service and increased availability for bikes and bike share and other things. But I, I do recognize and appreciate the concern if we looked at it in isolation. But um, we've seen other cities go this route. Seattle is a notable one, has gotten rid of parking, and their price of housing has, has gone down. And, has not caused the end of the world. So we hope we hope we'll have the same, you know, situation here. Yes. Uh, have you have you considered ideas such as uh, in Santa Monica, where the uh, developers were incentivized to create the public parking spaces and the uh, yeah. So with the ability to share parking or do um, consolidated sort of district level parking, I think that would be a preferred approach rather than. Every single individual building providing their little amount of parking. A parking one strategy for a neighborhood is much better, and we will continue to find incentives to do district level parking to supplement this. Yeah. Uh, about a month ago, I heard the president and CEO of Gensler Design um, They operate worldwide, but his contention was in the next. Um, Six to twenty years, everything's going wireless, which will eliminate like the need for big streets, eliminate park, parking, all this. Is this part of your plan, or is this is true of what he's, he's alluding to here? I'm not betting big on any one sort of predicted outcome. Um, we want to be flexible and make sure that we can accommodate changes that should happen, and that's why. Um, Yes, should we have a future where we don't need parking within a building, we want to make sure that we have habitable spaces that can be reused. So meaning design parking levels that have that flat floors so that you know a commercial space could come in. But I'm not going to say for certain that that is the future that's going to happen. Um, I'm a student of various plan documents through time. And one thing that I think a lot of them get tripped up on is betting big on any one transportation technology in the future. And we're not going to do this here. We'll be um, as adaptable for any sort of change in the future, whether it's you know technology in the streets um, or a driverless car situation, um, but not going to you know 
hang our hat on that. Can you briefly outline the, uh, the terms involved in the adaptive reuse to point out some of the benefits of it? Right. So currently, the adaptive reuse ordinance stops at Main Street. It would be pushed um, all the way to wherever housing is allowed, so the entirety of the fashion district. Um, the minimum unit size would be removed um, from it. And then an increased um, ability to get additional FAR in terms of roof additions, uh, basements, mezzanines, whereas today that can be a trickier process. So it's going to further streamline all those things. Will you apply that to commercial in this round? It will have more commercial applicability, yes. yes. All right, thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Rena Letty, the Executive Director of the BID, for those of you that I didn't get a chance to meet today. Um, thank you, Brian, for explaining something that everyone is very, very interested in knowing the timing of. Um, I wanted to take a minute to thank the staff of the, of the BID, um, Jasmine Ramos, who helped us coordinate this entire day, and Ariana Gomez um, for the trend report, and she worked with um, Chris, I don't know, yeah, Chris is still here, Chris Luce from Urbanize to gather the all of the information about the various products that are, projects that are happening. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I want to thank um, Randall Tampa, Director of Operations, and um, Jose um, Gonzalez, our Director of Finance and Human Resources, and Elmer Pacheco is in the back, our supervisor and manager for both the Clean and Safe project, and Jackie is unfortunately not able to um, attend today, but this group of people works really hard for all of you and I just wanted to um, maybe give them a round of applause. <laughs> and we also couldn't do any of the audio of the work and the projects that you saw earlier today and the future plans that Brian just um, talked about for our, for downtown and then our district specifically. We couldn't do that without a cleaner and safer bid and um, you, the property owners and the board of directors, realized that 20 plus years ago when you decided to create a bid. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to just highlight a little bit of what the clean team does and invite Trevor Kale, the vice president of operations for Chrysalis Enterprises, to talk a little bit about Chrysalis because I think it's a really special program that we're part of. The clean team picks up seven tons of trash a day um, which I don't even know what that really looks like in terms of, you know, what is seven tons? It's 636 pounds per person per day on our team. So they're picking up that much trash. So someone earlier mentioned how there's a lot more trash in the fashion district. We just have a lot more businesses and a lot more businesses that garner, generate trash. We also pressure wash 49,000 square feet of sidewalk per day and clean 84 tags of graffiti. And this is all due to the work that the Chrysalis team does um, with, under the tutelage of Elmer and Randall. And I want to um, thank you guys and also bring Trevor up to talk. Thanks for giving me a few minutes. I wanted to talk just a very briefly about our organization, so you have a sense of who we are if you don't know, and then about our role here in the fashion district and what it means for our organization. So Chrysalis is a nonprofit. We've been in downtown Los Angeles since the mid 80s. And what we do is we help people coming out of homelessness get a job and keep a job over time. That's our only focus. Uh, each year we help about 2,000 Angelinos do that in the private marketplace. So people who are coming out of the you know, streets of downtown Los Angeles and are wanting to find work and able to find work, we help, we help them to do that. Um, we've also got an office in Santa Monica and one in Bitcoin, and later this year we're excited to be opening one in Anaheim, which is a, a growth strategy for us, trying to help more people in the community who need it. A big part of what Chrysalis does and what I do, what I oversee my job at Chrysalis is to work uh, for our enterprises. So in the early 90s, we created our own businesses for men and women who weren't quite ready to be marketable to outside employers. These are people who came to Chrysalis with what we call the greatest barriers to employment. Maybe they haven't worked for a long time. Uh, maybe they don't present very well, maybe they're just coming out of incarceration or, or just kind of getting back on their feet from substance abuse. And employers weren't willing to take a chance on employing them, so we employ them ourselves. And in our program, they can work with us for up to one year, and they work with us doing just what 
is needed here in the fashion district. So that 638 pounds per day is a big, it's a big job for people. And through that program, it's really giving people the opportunity to um, prove that they're a good employee, prove that their past doesn't matter, that they're ready, ready and willing to work, and to create a pathway to self-sufficiency. So I wanted to come and speak and just say thank you to the board members, the stakeholders in the fashion district. Rena and her team are amazing partners in this to work with. Um, it takes a lot of work to get seven tons of trash up every single day. And um, things happen along the way, and we work together so seamlessly to make it happen, so thanks. Thanks for that. I also just want to let you know that you know, by hiring us, I feel like you guys really are doing your part um, to address some of the homeless concerns that we have here. This is, Christmas is one real way that you can do something, and choosing us has done that, so thank you. Last year alone, just in the fashion district, uh, we employed people and offered over 50,000 hours of employment. That's opportunity for um, you know, a couple hundred men and women who wouldn't have the opportunity otherwise. Um, and they are, they've also earned about $650,000 or more um, in, their, in their paycheck so that they can take care of themselves and work, work themselves out off the street. So wanted to take time to thank you for that. on um, how we got to where we are today and what's coming in the future. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Um, the last presentation, so hang in there, we're almost there. that the fashion district has to offer. 
and really honor our history as the home of the West Coast fashion apparel industry while looking to the future and acknowledging that we are you know, a historic district that is diverse and inclusive of a number of industries and people. Uh, we are inviting and open to everybody that wants to be here uh, and of course fashionable and connected because everybody here knows each other and does business together. So how do we do that? How do we do you know, tell the fashion district story. And in true fashion form, we decided to do it through color. Uh, we decided to look at what is in our district and take it in and make it part of our brand. So you'll see our new logo, which you've already seen. We, we roll it out in, all over uh, this room today. But this is really a representation, I feel like a more abstract representation of what the fashion district is. Our Block letters are inspired by the architecture of the district. The various colors represent the various industries and people that are here, and then they interconnect to reflect that connectivity that the district has and that makes it so special. The colors themselves were inspired by the district. You see them in the umbrellas in Santee Alley, you see them in the flower markets, you see them in the fabric displays on Ninth and Maple, you see them in the paint job at the San Pedro Wholesale Mart, and in the colors of City Market South. It truly is a representation of the fashion district. You'll even find these colors in the marquise of the Orpheum and the Ace Hotel. And we've already started rolling it out. Uh, as I said, we actually just got these in last week, our new uniform, so you'll be seeing our clean and safe team with our new uh, brand new logo. Um, our e-newsletter if you're not signed up for it you definitely should do that let me know i can help you with that as well as our turn report uh, and we have a couple of new things coming including some street pole banners uh, a development map an economic development infographic we'll be redoing the trash can signage on the street and as well as putting up a new fashion district uh, map guide and it's been a truly incredible experience for the band to finally see this project through and I think for staff it's also been a very sweet experience to finally see this happen and rolled out so we wanted to share a little bit of uh, that sweetness with you and Jasmine is passing out a little takeaway for you to take home tonight uh, maybe you can have it with coffee later and when you bite into it and you think like oh this is really good this is what the fashion district is so great beautiful, sweet place to come and do business. Thank you. Does anybody have questions? Good. Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our event here. So I want to thank uh, Councilman Weezar for taking his time out today and from the city schedule to speak with us. And, and also I want to thank all the projects here that are being exhibited. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, please take a look if they're in the back of the room. Uh, Brian, uh, I want to thank Brian Eck for his time and his presentation as well. Uh, he's been really instrumental in the uh, development of the fashion district for the future of the development of the fashion district. Uh, Trevor, uh, thank you also for your presentation. It's very much appreciated by the house speakers from the board and I'm also on the street as well. So thank you for your for your good work and effort in the district. Um, and before we conclude, uh, we want to recognize someone very special to our team uh, that is uh, retiring. Uh, Randall Tampa has been with us, uh, what has it been 15 years? 14 years? A very long time. And uh, he has been uh, so helpful with um, the clean and safe and the operations, and he's kept this thing together, uh, you know, it's good, in the good, sometimes not so good, but he's been there trying true day in and day out. So uh, as chair, I, I want to personally thank you. And, uh, and we also have uh, a, uh, a red words of recognition. We also have a retirement gift for you. So Randall, thank you for your service and your time <laughs> and your dedicated work. And please give him a hand of applause. Thank you, Randall. Can you come up here, Randall? I think we got to a clock. That means time's ticking.
shy of 14 years. So I got the call from Ken Smith back in June of 2004, and it was supposed to be an interim position, and here I am. So, uh, but the wife and I, we moved to Arizona. Uh, she's retired. I'm now officially retired, and uh, I appreciate everything everyone has done for me. It's been a great time with you all. Elisa, thank you very much. I just met her Tuesday. We're talking about Gates still. So I haven't had a break, but uh, thank you, Kahan, sir. Thank you, sir, for everything you did for me. So uh, grab a piece of cake and we'll celebrate. Thank you. Well, with that said, uh, we're going to conclude our annual meeting and uh, please uh, take a look at the final, if they're still up, and uh, we're going to uh, now proceed with our, our board meeting. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your time and thank you for your support.